Greetings and salutations, everyone. My name is Andrew Kirkoff, and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today, we're talking about my Week 14 tight end and quarterback rankings for the 2022 fantasy football season. Over the course of today's episode, we're covering all topics related to the tight end and quarterback positions, beginning with matchups. We'll talk about which defenses thus far this season, on average, have been giving up the most points to opposing tight ends and quarterbacks, one and a half PPR scoring format and the other in a four point per passing touchdown format, giving ourselves a little bit more perspective as to which of these matchups going into the given week we have to take advantage of and which players we might want to avoid based on certain matchups. After we talk about said subject, we'll then transition into talking about our top 16 tied in and quarterback rankings, giving you guys my opinions and the statistics that justify the reasons as to why I've gone ahead and stacked up the position and such and how I think it's going to pan out when it's all said and done at the end of week 14. Again, it's win to get in for many of our situations. I wanted to go ahead and again, put out a tied in and quarterback rankings video. So for those of you who have any questions in regards to the position, they can be answered as to potentially guys you might have to go pick up considering we have six teams on by, including the Atlanta Falcons, Chicago Bears, Green Bay Packers, Indianapolis Colts, New Orleans Saints, and Washington Commanders. And with all that taken into account, there is a very thin margin for error. So we want to make sure that we have all the perfect prospects in the right position so we can go ahead and succeed in this given week. Again, even though we're putting out rankings on Thursday, don't forget rankings are subject to change. Over the course of the remainder of the week, information will be divulged in regards to injuries, perhaps guys like David Njoku, Trevor Lawrence, who will both be mentioned on today's episode, and whether or not they're even going to be you know, participants in this upcoming weekend's game. We're going to keep monitoring that. For those of you who are trying to stay up to date on my latest content, be sure to subscribe again after tonight's Thursday night football game between the Los Angeles Rams and the Las Vegas Raiders. We're going to go ahead and be live streaming here on the channel. So if you have any questions in regards to starter, starter sits, you know, trade questions, anything of that nature, be sure to swing on by and ask away. I'll try to help to the best of my ability. Speaking of Thursday night's football game, again, for those of you who guys who haven't checked out price picks, again, you can go ahead and play price picks today. Currently, they have an offer going into this week. In regards to week 14, Justin Herbert going more than 0.5 passing yards. It's an automatic free square in an upcoming entry. If you guys want to go ahead, take advantage of this. There's a link down in the description. You can go ahead, use promo code Andrew today. And when you use the promo code, your first time deposit is immediately doubled up to $100. Again, you can accompany that with potential players into this week's matchups or in guys playing in tonight's game between the Las Vegas Raiders and Los Angeles Rams. Like I've mentioned in the past, the entire point of Price picks is to go ahead and predict the potential for successes or failure for fantasy prospects. And in the case of NFL players, again, it's passing yards, rushing yards, receiving yards, any of the following statistics that you can see, even rushing attempts, guys like Josh Jacobs versus Cam Akers, you can go ahead, put together some entries for tonight's game. Of course, you can even play the first half of tonight's game. Maybe even want to play with the NBA. Again, I've had a lot of luck via the NBA as late. I'll show you guys. All of the potential prize pick entries I've put over the course of the week via the NBA in tonight's live stream. So if those of you are interested, go ahead, swing on by. Outside of that, there's a link down in the description. Thank you very much. All right, so let's go ahead and let's talk about tight end matchups going into week 14. As you can see to the right side of the screen, we have how many points have been given up to opposing tight ends since week 7 on a per week average in a half PPR scoring format. Now, when we go ahead and isolate receiving statistics alone, we find that the Arizona Cardinals have been giving up the most points, primarily because they can't stop giving up touchdowns to opposing tight ends. Now, when you go ahead and compare the amount of targets that the Arizona Cardinals have seen to opposing tight ends in comparison to the Buffalo Bills, the Buffalo Bills technically have seen more targets to opposing tight ends over the course of this span of time. Yet, they haven't allowed touchdowns, and quite frankly, they haven't given up much yardage after the catch either, which typically is the determining factor as to whether or not a tight end can really tear apart a defense. Nonetheless, we take all this information into account with a multitude of other variables to find our given rankings within the week. I will be referring back to these statistics over the course of today's episode, but I can assure you, you know, these great matchups like the Arizona Cardinals, Los Angeles Rams, Miami Dolphins, Jacksonville Jaguars, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they can all be taken advantage of by prime prospects that many of you have on roster going into the week. So let's go ahead and begin with our number one, Travis Kelsey. Obviously, it's a given. We're going to go ahead and start Travis Kelsey in every scenario that we have. The only thing that I wanted to mention before we move on to Travis Kelsey is that the current record for most fantasy points in a season and a half PPR scoring format is retained by Rob Gronkowski from the 2011 season in which he had 285.9 half PPR fantasy points. Currently, with the 17.32 fantasy point per game average that Kelsey has put forth, he is on pace in a 16-game season to put up 277 points, which would just fall short, but in a 17-game season, assuming he plays the entire year, he would be on pace to shatter the record and go for 294.38 fantasy points, which obviously wouldn't be fair considering the extra game, but nonetheless, he's on pace for some legendary numbers, of course, but continuing to start him every single week. 
Moving on, let's talk about Mark Andrews. Tyler Huntley has found a lot of success with Mark Andrews, especially in 2021. I mentioned this on Monday's waiver wire episode in regards to Huntley, but I'll go ahead and mention this again. When Mark Andrews had Tyler Huntley late last season, throughout a five-game stretch, Mark Andrews was an unstoppable force. And quite frankly, the opportunities that he was given in terms of targets from Tyler Huntley, you know, were second to none, really. I mean, over the course of the five games that they played together in 2021, Mark Andrews was averaging 11 targets, 8.6 receptions, 99.6 receiving yards, and 0.6 receiving touchdowns per game for a 17.86 fantasy point per game average. There was a reason why he was able to overthrow Travis Kelsey's streak of number one overall tight end seasons because mainly he was targeted a bunch. Tyler Huntley was throwing the ball in Mark Andrews' direction 31.07% of the time. Overall, I think this is going to potentially continue this upcoming week as they take on the Pittsburgh Steelers and Tyler Huntley is back in the lineup. Moving on, let's talk about TJ Hawkinson. He takes on his former team in the Detroit Lions. This is going to be an interesting revenge game because the Detroit Lions defense, they have given up their fair share of points to opposing tight ends. Of course, Evan Ingram most recently, five catches, 30 yards, and a touchdown. Cole Komet, four catches, 72, and two touchdowns. Mike Kosicki, three catches, 38, and a touchdown. Uh, the plethora of tight ends from the Green Bay Packers accumulated nine catches for 89. And even the Dallas Cowboys uh, tight ends had themselves eight catches, 61, and a touchdown. That's just over the course of the last six, seven weeks of recent performances. All of them automatic successes against the Detroit Lions defense. I absolutely believe that the Vikings are going to approach this matchup with the conscious effort of getting TJ Hawkinson the ball. So he could pretty much say, thank you for trading me to another team and getting me out of this organization. But, you know, it's going to be a pretty fun one between these two teams. Definitely a, a big revenge game here for TJ Hawkinson. Moving on, let's talk about Dalton Schultz. Now, I'm a little bit skeptical on the approach of Dalton Schultz, but I'll give you guys a couple you know, uh, arguments on both sides, pros and potential cons. Obviously, when you look back at last week's performance against the Indianapolis Colts, he had a 14-yard receiving touchdown that was knocked out of his hands while he was in the end zone. It was a great play by the defender, but he obviously could have made it for his entire week getting over 10 points, which would have saved many of us fantasy weeks. I mean, I would have won multiple weeks considering I lost by, you know, fractions of points just because of a couple missed plays here and there. But either way, we're moving on. In regards to the potential of going into this week, considering it may be a blowout against the Houston Texans, and the most two recent blowouts, which was Indianapolis and Minnesota, have resulted in Dalton Schultz only putting up 3.7, 4.3 fantasy points, leads me to believe that Dalton Schultz in his current average of 9.55 fantasy points per game since the return of Dak Prescott is going to be looked at as perhaps something that isn't as potentially attainable because they're going to be running the ball. Their defense is going to be dominating. The Houston Texans are not going to put up you know, any points on the board, and therefore they won't be able to pass the ball as much in the second half. But that being said, in the two matchups in which they've blown out the Minnesota Vikings and Indianapolis Colts, both those teams have been pretty good in terms of stopping opposing tight ends. So perhaps it was a factor of matchups along with the overall potential of that blowout. But if in fact we're in a situation that the Houston Texans, of course, are giving up their fair share of points to opposing tight ends, Give up a couple touchdowns early to Dalton Schultz. He may be in a fantastic position to succeed. Moving on, let's talk about George Kittle. Again, George Kittle with Brock Purdy is going to be in a tough situation. I just primarily want to focus on the matchup itself. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers versus tight ends as of late. New Orleans, four catches, 63 and a touchdown. Of course, we saw Taysom Hill dominate against that team. We, and of course, Taysom Hill was the number one tight end of the week in week 13. Imagine that. And not only that, we saw the Cleveland Browns, of course, with David Njoku, seven catches, 38 and a touchdown as a combined tight end. Uh, room there the Seattle Seahawks tight end six catches 69 Baltimore Ravens 10 catches 114 in a touchdown of course primarily with the efforts of Isaiah Likely either way I think this is a fantastic matchup hopefully we're going to get George Kittle utilized at a higher capacity than it was last week and get him back on track moving on let's talk about Pat Fryermuth. Pat Fryermuth had an opportunity where he caught the ball ran down the sideline went for 57 of his total 76 yards an incredible play the next play after his backup tight end comes in the game and scores a 17-yard touchdown. Could have been his and could have had even more upside in the given week. As long as Kenny Pickett continues to go to his tight end, Pat Fryermuth, he has a lot of value in terms of fantasy going forward. Moving on, let's talk about Gerald Everett. Gerald Everett is coming off another big week here. And as long as Mike Williams continues to be slow to his return, Gerald Everett's going to continue to have opportunities presented to himself in the form of targets. Now, specifically, when you take on the Miami Dolphins, I mean, any target is going to be valuable considering how many points they've given up to opposing tight ends over the course of the last two months now since week seven. 13.12 on average. And the primary reason that exists is mainly because even though George Kittle did not find success against this defense last week, Houston, seven catches, 81 and a touchdown. Cleveland tight ends, five catches, 28 and a touchdown. Chicago tight ends, five for 41 and two touchdowns. Detroit, 
5 for 100 receiving yards, and even Pittsburgh, 11 for 81. There have been so many success stories against this defense. I think Gerald Everett's going to be another one. Moving on to Greg Dulcich. Now, earlier this week, we were given the quote from head coach Nathaniel Hackett and primary play caller at times, of course, because I know he's passed off his play calling duties to Kubiak, but really, uh, I think he still has a huge say in what exactly is going on in that offense. But at this current moment in time, we heard Nathaniel Hackett earlier in the week say that Greg Dulcich is being utilized more and more in the wide receiver role. Now, if that's going to be something of a permanent factor, sure, that's great. But quite frankly, when I looked at his snap counts out wide and in the slot and in the inline, it really hasn't moved in comparison to prior weeks. He quite literally only lined up once out wide and was playing in the slot position 54% of the times this last week. And even the week prior to that, he had a higher percentage of snaps from the slot position. So there's really nothing new in the quote that Nathaniel Hackett said. It's just a matter of whether or not we're going to target Greg Dulcich. If they're going to, fantastic. We've already talked about this. He is a fantastic vertical threat as a tight end, similar to a David Njoku. It's just a matter of opportunity leading to his overall success in a given week. Moving on to Foster Monroe. The second best matchup of the week belongs to Foster Monroe taking on the Los Angeles Rams tonight. I think Foster Monroe, considering his opportunities within this offense, will have his fair share of targets but it's a matter of whether or not he's going to be able to deliver on them. Last week, he was a little bit banged up in that game, obviously fell down on the sideline, was evaluated for a concussion or some sort of injury, then came back and was able to not really put up much of a performance, only had one catch for 32 yards. But there were opportunities there down the sideline that he could have made some big plays. Either way, the LA Rams versus tight ends over the course of the last couple weeks here. Of course, Noah Fant had himself a big game last week. The week prior to that was Travis Kelsey. The week prior to that was Juwan Johnson. The week prior to that, you know, Cade Otten. The week prior to that, George Kittle. Five consecutive weeks of giving up touchdowns to opposing tight ends and a boatload of yards. I mean, we're talking about 101, 74, 67, 99, and 76. Foster Moreau, get ready for a big game tonight. Moving on to Evan Ingram, our number 10. Evan Ingram, again, he is very inconsistent. And I will say, be cautious of playing him. And quite frankly, be cautious of every tight end, considering how much volatility there is at the position as a whole. But at this current moment in time, I think Evan Ingram still against Tennessee, considering the matchup itself, and the fact that they're utilizing more and more down in the red zone. Again, the, the reason why he scored a touchdown, because they had a pick play down within the five-yard line in which they baited Christian Kirk and found a wide open Evan Ingram. If they're going to continue to utilize him at that capacity, a fantastic you know receiving option and tight end option for the given week. Moving on to David Njoku. And again, we're not 100% certain if David Njoku is going to be healthy. All of last week, he was a you know did not participate kind of factor. Did not practice once. Already this week on Wednesday, got himself a limited participation in practice. Deshaun Watson needs a security blanket over the middle. And if David Njoku could be exactly that, especially up against the Cincinnati Bengals, who have given up their fair share of good performances to opposing tight ends as of late, I absolutely would love to see David Njoku line up this week because he'd have himself a pretty good game here. Moving on to Hunter Henry. Hunter Henry has not literally been mentioned in a tight end quarterback ranking sense since probably week one, I want to say. And mainly because he has been completely off the scene. This year, they have not utilized the tight end position, especially down in the red zone as much, and quite frankly, haven't targeted him at a high enough capacity. Now, even though last season, he quite frankly didn't have many targets per game, was averaging about five per game, I think over the course of the last couple of weeks, we've seen him obviously been participating more, getting himself 10 targets, five each of the last two weeks, and has scored a touchdown most recently against the Minnesota Vikings. If in fact, Hunter Henry, against the best matchup in the given week, can dominate and score a touchdown against the Arizona Cardinals, again, they have given up six touchdowns in the last six games that they have played to opposing tight ends. Could be a fantastic play for this week. Moving on to Noah Fant. Like I mentioned via the waiver wire episode, Noah Fant probably has more longevity than a guy like uh, you know Hunter Henry in terms of fantasy value, but the primary reason we might want to avoid him and or play him is because Noah Fant is either going to be one of two things. He's either going to score six and a half points or he's going to score 12 and a half points because of that touchdown influx. So he's either going to have four catches for 45 yards or he's going to end up getting four catches for 45 yards and a touchdown. We'd love to see the touchdown upside in the given week against the Carolina Panthers. It's not a bad matchup. It's just a matter of whether or not Geno Smith is looking in his direction for this upcoming weekend score. All right, let's go ahead and move on to our number 14, Chigozim Okonkwo. The tight end for the Tennessee Titans over the course of the last couple of weeks has built a little bit of momentum. 10 targets, 7 catches, 103 yards in the last two games for 13.8 fantasy points. Takes on the Jacksonville Jaguars, who they themselves have given up their fair share of points to opposing tight ends. Again, Baltimore combined for 8 catches, 126 and a touchdown. Kansas City, 9 catches, 107, 2 touchdowns. Las Vegas, 4 for 42. Denver, 4 for 87. And Detroit, 3 for 29. Again, They've given up a lot of points to good tight ends, primarily. But it does not mean 
that Shigozimo Konkwo cannot step up and have himself a big game here. The contesting factor is, of course, whether or not Ryan Tannehill is going to get the job done, whether or not Traylon Burks is going to be active, and whether or not, you know, Austin Hooper can garner for some targets. This last week, Okonkwo did outsnap uh, Austin Hooper and, of course, was getting more targets. If that is going to be a consistent factor within this offense, I think he can absolutely be a play in the given week. Moving on to Tyler Higby. Proceed with caution. Tyler Higby has been extremely consistent this season, especially without Matthew Stafford. And there is a little bit of a talk as to whether or not it's going to be John Walford and or potentially Baker Mayfield even tonight if Walford cannot go in the night's matchup because of his injury. If that's going to be the case, I have even more confidence that Baker Mayfield will just funnel target Tyler Higby. But quite frankly, I just have him here because the tight end position is volatile. There isn't many other prospects remaining here that could be mentioned in a higher upside capacity or at least have potential to find that end zone. Moving on to the final player I wanted to mention in regards to tight end is Daniel Bellinger, the rookie tight end for the New York Giants. He has recently come back from injury. In his return, five catches on five targets for 24 yards. Not a great game, but overall, in terms of the potential for him to get a garbage time touchdown, it's a lot higher than other potential prospects. Therefore, we'll go ahead and suggest Daniel Bellinger at this capacity. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk about matchups at the quarterback position going into week 14. As you can see to the right side of the screen, when we isolate quarterback passing statistics alone, passing yards, passing touchdowns, passing interceptions, in a four-point per passing touchdown league, minus two per interception, we find that the Arizona Cardinals, Los Angeles Rams, Jacksonville Jaguars have been giving up the most points to opposing quarterbacks over the course of the last two months, weeks seven through 13. Now, when we take that into account, of course, it gives us a little bit of perspective as to which quarterbacks we might want to play. Of course, perhaps Mac Jones could be of value to us this upcoming week if the Arizona Cardinals defense is lacking. And of course, the New England Patriots want to put together a passing offense that isn't terrible. But again, that's a pipe dream. The Los Angeles Rams going up against Derek Carr. Derek Carr has been on a consistent streak of play. We'll talk about it in just a moment. But he's not slowing down anytime soon because they've been giving up their fair share of touchdowns. And Aaron Donald will not be active tonight to get after Derek Carr. Either way, take these statistics at face value. We will be referring back to these over the course of today's video. Again, it's a part of the equation because when we're talking about the quarterback position and points allowed and the 11 other defenders on the opposite side of the field with the singular job of trying to get after that quarterback and make them you know, fail, the fact of the matter is these statistics matter. So as we progress, we'll refer back to these. Otherwise, let's go ahead and begin with our number one quarterback of the week. It is Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts is coming off of his second best fantasy quarterback performance of his career. An unbelievable game of 34.4 points, 380 passing yards, three passing touchdowns, and a rushing touchdown. I was going to say, you know, that's a lot of passing yards, 380, but that's not even his career high. You go back to his rookie season and the guy was slinging it back then. Either way, Jalen Hurts has had himself six consecutive games of over 20 fantasy points in a four point per passing touchdown format. He takes on a advantageous matchup Against the secondary that is certainly shorthanded, I absolutely believe that he's going to dominate against his division rival, against the New York Giants. Have himself a fantastic game here in Week 14. Moving on to Josh Allen. He's an automatic play. Even though he takes on a division rival in the New York Jets, and the last time he took on that defense, they certainly gave him a lot of trouble. I expect him to get back on track and put together another big performance here of 200-plus passing yards, two touchdowns, and whatever he's able to accumulate on the ground with his legs because we know the upside there can very easily make your fantasy week and perhaps even land Josh Allen as the number one quarterback in a given week. Moving on, let's talk about Patrick Mahomes. Even though he's been on a very successful streak of games here, when he typically takes on the Denver Broncos defense, he does not play well. In the last four matchups against that defense, he's only been able to score two touchdowns maximum. In three out of the last four games against the Denver Broncos, has only put up one touchdown. 270 yards, 184, 318, and 200. Again, the secondary for the Denver Broncos certainly bothers Patrick Mahomes. They've learned how to go ahead and you know limit him out of capacity. So at this current moment in time, even though Patrick Mahomes has incredible upside in the given week, coming off of a you know lackluster performance against the Cincinnati Bengals, who certainly have his number, if you know the Denver Broncos are able to implement anything that the Cincinnati Bengals approached with, they could definitely try to stop him, or you know at very best just limit him to not having that much of an explosive week. That's why he sits at number three. Otherwise, he's an automatic play. Moving on to Justin Herbert taking on the Miami Dolphins. Fact of the matter is, Justin Herbert's going into town. Hopefully, we'll have Mike Williams back, and hopefully. His center, Corey Lindsay, will be off concussion protocol, will have a healthy left tackle and right tackle, and with less pressure in his face, he'll be able to sit in the pocket and deliver the ball. I mean, he's coming off of an 18.1 fantasy point contribution with a very lackluster game. And in my opinion, one of the worst games that he has played this season. 
So in my mind, I'm expecting Justin Herbert to have himself a bounce back performance against a secondary that certainly can be taken advantage of. Moving on. Speaking of that secondary, let's talk about the Dolphins and Tua Tunga Bailoa going into this week. Again, he's coming off of a performance in which, sure, two interceptions that were, you know, really not great, missed a couple passes that could have been 60-yard touchdowns, at least was able to complete one of them that became a 60-yard touchdown. But overall, Tua is very similar to a Jimmy G. Like I've mentioned in the past, guys, the 49ers offenses, and it's not a coincidence because Mike McDaniel is now there, former office coordinator for the 49ers. You know, the 49ers scheme or Kyle Shanahan's scheme as he's built it allows quarterbacks to sit in the pocket, deliver it to their playmakers, and let their playmakers you know, pretty much dictate the game. And that's what they've done with Jalen Waddle, with, you know, Tyree Kill, similar to the way that, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo used to do it with Debo Samuel, George Kittle, Christian McCaffrey. And the fact of the matter is, Tua needs a healthy offensive line. He needs his right and left tackle back. Hopefully, Teron Armstead will be active this week. We know Eric Fisher was signed to play the right tackle position. And if the running game is back, on top of the fact that they take on the Los Angeles Chargers, it'll open up more of a play-action approach, which will open up the passing game and make it that much easier to move the ball on the Los Angeles Chargers defense. Moving on, let's talk about Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow is coming off a really good week. I mean, again, he is the kryptonite for the Kansas City Chiefs. Kansas City fans do not want to see a schedule, potentially, in which they take on the Cincinnati Bengals in the playoffs until the AFC Championship game, because otherwise they're going home potentially early. Joe Burrow has been great over the course of the last month, but the last time he took on the Cleveland Browns, he wasn't so great. They lost 13-32 to in a blowout game in which he was sacked five times. But I can assure you, we're going to get into a position now that the offensive line is significantly better, whether it's running or pass blocking. They're also going to be in a position where Joe Burrow, with Jamar Chase back, will have an opportunity of taking on that defense. And in my mind, will have a far more significant performance coming off of a week in which, I mean, surprisingly had 11 rushing attempts for 46 rushing yards and a rushing touchdown. At times was making accidental plays that many of us were not anticipating, but we'll take it in terms of fantasy purposes. And hopefully we'll continue that moving on. Let's talk about Jared Goff for number seven. Again, we had Amon Ross St. Brown as the thumbnail of yesterday's wide receiver rankings video for a reason. This is going to be one of the best matchups of the week. The Detroit Lions as a team have won four out of the last five games. Quite frankly, should have won maybe even six out of the last six games. Only lost to Buffalo by three and Miami by four. Now, I preface all of this information to tell you that this week, the Detroit Lions going to Minnesota are a favorite as a 5-7 and seven football team against a 10-2 and two football team. Just putting that in perspective as to what we're potentially expecting to see here. Going into this week with the consistency that Jared Goff has built, the running game that we have, the wide receiver advantageous matchups that we have against the secondary that has not been able to stop anybody. I mean, again, Mike White threw for over 300 yards, threw the ball 57 times and wasn't punished enough. I expect to see Jared Goff have himself a big performance this week and another one of these you know, defining performances of the year if, in fact, they're able to pull it out and put together a victory as they win streak for the remainder of the season. Let's talk about the next player. It is Kirk Cousins on the other side of this game. Of course, this is going to be a high-scoring event. Earlier this season, when Kirk Cousins took on the Detroit Lions, 260 passing yards, two passing touchdowns, 18.3 fantasy points, all while Justin Jefferson in that same game had himself only 14 receiving yards. If we're going to be in a position where Justin Jefferson is going to explode for another big performance here, I'm expecting to see Kirk Cousins minimum of 250 passing yards, two passing touchdowns, if not more. And if that's going to be the case, we'll be an even better quarterback. That's why I have him at number eight. Moving on, let's talk about number nine, Geno Smith. Speaking of two passing touchdowns and a streak of doing so, Geno Smith has had a six consecutive game streak of two or more passing touchdowns. Not only that, he's been able to accomplish two or more passing touchdowns in 10 of his 12 games this season. He is one of the most consistent quarterbacks at this current moment in time. And the way that Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf continue to play with sprinkles of Noah Fant and the fact that we don't have Kenneth Walker and even potentially DJ Dallas or Travis Homer this week and Tony Jones Jr. may be the starting running back for this team with Wayne Gallman. We're in a position where they're going to be throwing the entire time against the Carolina Panthers, which will only help Geno Smith's underlying fantasy value. Moving on, let's talk about Kyler Murray. Kyler Murray is in a perfect position to succeed. Typically, when Bill Belichick takes on mobile quarterbacks, he definitely struggles because it's difficult for that defense in the way that they're taught, in the way that they're built, with you know the lack of speed that they purely have to contain a quarterback at this kind of capacity. So if Kyler Murray is able to use his advantages of his legs, extend plays with the volume of threats that he has of DeAndre Hopkins, Marquise Brown, and Ronda Moore hopefully coming back from injury, along with James Conner and this offensive line getting healthy, by all means, I'm expecting to see Kyler Murray have himself a big performance here in week 14. Moving on to Dak Prescott. Okay, so here's the thing about Dak Prescott. Last couple weeks have been a little bit, you know, 
back and forth in terms of his overall performances, mainly because they're blowing out a lot of teams. But, you know, 170 yards and three passing touchdowns last week. You know, 20 for 30 passing wasn't the greatest overall week he could have had. But it was a block game in which he still scored himself 16.8 fantasy points. So if we're able to see Dak Prescott continue to be someone that can throw the ball, you know, into the end zone early and not get all of his touchdowns siphoned from Zeke and Pollard on the goal line, we're going to be in a situation where he could definitely be a quarterback one value going into the week. But anything upside is going to be a matter of whether or not this is a competitive game. Sure, Dak Prescott could show up, throw for six passing touchdowns and leave the game at halftime. It could very easily happen. But in terms of this offense, their willingness to run the ball, especially down in the red zone, I'm expecting Dak to be limited consider the matchup. And of course, the capacity of his running backs to just roll through this Houston defense. Moving on, let's talk about Derek Carr. Speaking of being extremely consistent, in comparison to Geno Smith, the next most consistent quarterback in terms of throwing touchdowns at a high capacity that you know aren't really at that top tier is really Derek Carr. Derek Carr has had five consecutive games or two or more passing touchdowns and has been able to throw for two or more passing touchdowns in nine of his 12 games this season. Takes on the Los Angeles Rams tonight, which is the second best matchup at the position. I think this is an automatic smash play considering the successes that we have seen from Devontae Adams over the course of the last month. Derek Carr continues to benefit from the number one wide receiving potential option of the season. Devontae Adams. Moving on, let's talk about Mike White as a number 13. Again, we mentioned him as the potential number one pickup of the week in terms of quarterback waiver wire standing. If in fact any of the other players that I've mentioned already aren't available, you go with Mike White, mainly because he's coming off of a week in which he had 57 passing attempts, 369 passing yards, could have had himself a passing touchdown along with two rushing touchdowns. Unfortunately, was not able to get Braxton Berrios to haul that ball in and unfortunately wasn't able to surpass the one yard line, literally needed a half of an inch to get into the end zone. One wasn't able to accomplish that either. Nonetheless, I'm expecting this matchup against the Buffalo Bills to be competitive. The Buffalo Bills have given up their fair share of points to opposing quarterbacks over the last couple of weeks. I mean, Jared Goff a couple of weeks ago really pushed them to the limits. And I think a team like, you know, the New York Jets, who have already beaten the Buffalo Bills earlier this year with Zach Wilson at quarterback. Zach Wilson in that game, 18 for 25 passing, a 72% passing completion percentage, 150 passing yards and a touchdown. I'm expecting this team to air it out with an air raid with Mike White. If he's not punished in terms of interceptions, he's going to continue to throw in garbage time for a lot of fantasy points. Moving on to Tyler Huntley on number 14. Tyler Huntley, like I mentioned on Monday's waiver wire video, in specific, in the five starts that he had in 2021, averaged 16.02 fantasy points per game. Now, in last week's performance, put up a 15.58 fantasy point performance, which is pretty much in line for what we're expecting. 15, 16 fantasy points obviously has the upside of a 30-point game considering his rushing potential, 10 attempts for 41 yards and a touchdown. But when they had Tyler Huntley step into that game last week. And one of the primary reasons why I don't have any, you know, Ravens running backs even ranked in the given week has to do with the fact that as soon as Tyler Huntley came in the game, not only did he throw the ball 32 times and was 27 for 32, which is an 84.4% passing completion percentage, right? On the 40 plus dropbacks that he had, majority of those resulted in completed passings and or scrambles by the quarterback and or sacks. And they went ahead and they completely abandoned the running game. If they're going to go ahead and once again do so, Tyler Huntley should be a great play against Pittsburgh secondary. Moving on to Daniel Jones at number 15. Again, Daniel Jones does play against Philadelphia, yet I still believe that there is a lot of hope that Daniel Jones can get the job done. He's a pretty good fantasy quarterback. The fact that he's able to accumulate yards on the ground at the capacity that he's able to, 12 carries for 71 yards against Washington this last week, he could very easily accomplish that against the Philadelphia Eagles, a defense that in their own right, yes, they're probably going to take a lead as an offense, but that defense is going to give up their fair share of points. Whether it's in garbage time or whether it's early, whether or not the New York Giants keep up, I'm expecting Daniel Jones to be a decent fantasy option in the given week. Moving on to the final option, we have Trevor Lawrence. I'm approaching this with caution because, again, he's dealing with a toe injury. And, you know, obviously last week during the game was, you know, dealing with that and really led to his performance not really being great. 17 for 31 passing, a 54.8% passing completion percentage in a contest against Detroit that should have been an automatic smash play. Either way, we'll keep this monitored as the week progresses, but he could be an option in the given week. That's going to cover for me today. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Before the video ends, do me a favor. Click the like button down below. Subscribe if you have not yet. Of course, if you guys want to go ahead and ask me some questions, you can do so down in the comment section, or you can join us later tonight. After the Thursday night football game, I will be live streaming here on the channel. Again, if you guys want to continue to get more action in terms of daily fantasy, if you don't have anybody playing in tonight's game, or just want to continue to get more you know, daily fantasy in your life, picking more or less on given player statistics, be sure to check out Price Picks. Again, they have the current entry going into this week with Justin Herbert being an automatic 0.5 
or more passing yards. Again, you want to go ahead and take advantage of that free square, put him in with a potential entry, whether it's tonight, maybe someone like Derek Carr surpassing his 1.5 passing touchdowns. Again, we talked about, you know, he was able to put together five consecutive games of two or more passing touchdowns. Could be another one here tonight. Either way, check that out. There's a link down in the description. Use promo code Andrew because when you do, your first time deposit is immediately doubled up to $100. So if you want to go ahead and play Daily Fantasy, be sure to check out Prize Picks. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Until tomorrow or until later tonight, I'll see you guys. Peace.